Okay, so, so thanks for that great introduction. Uh, a little bit about me just in terms of relevance for the talk. So uh, my first 11 years of my career was random engineering stuff sort of all over the stack. But really in my 12 years as a manager, I've constantly been doing platforms in one way or another. So in, in EC2, I was sort of building this next generation hypervisor platform. I spent two years at a FinTech uh, where I was literally doing what a lot of people are doing, moving into Kubernetes, moving to the public cloud. At Daydog, you know, about 18 months in, I sort of moved into this role, what we call core engineering, but it's really platform engineering. And sort of out of that, I, I've got a co-author, and we, we decided to sort of write a book on platform engineering, which is uh, uh, hopefully we'll get to the publisher by the end of this month. Okay, so this talk, I'm going to define platform engineering. There's a lot of sort of uh, people out there trying to define it in different ways. Uh, my co-author and I take a very uh, definitive thing of what it is and what it is not. So I wanted to talk about what it is and, and why, why we want to define it. Uh, then the two real parts of Datadog, I want to talk about how we did in terms of org structure, uh, talk about like the pros and cons of having a platform engineering org, uh, and then this, this other thing, sort of how Datadog actually built platforms. What, what did it mean to get these things into production and people using them and the, the business sort of relying upon them? Okay, so defining platform engineering. So this is actually my co-author is to thank for this. Uh, this is straight from the book. Um, so, so we want to emphasize every, everything in each of these lines is something we want to emphasize. So we want to emphasize developing platforms, sort of getting away from this idea, this is just glue code, this is just developer tools, uh, uh, def definitely the tooling, very small thing approach. We want this to be platforms, but platforms are substantial. Um, abstract away complexity, we, we all know that's what platforms do. Uh, we want to emphasize the operating reliable and scalable foundation. So, so one thing that you often find that infra teams and SRE teams do great is reliable and scalable foundations. They often a little bit forget about the usability of what they provide. That, that's often why they struggle with uh, building platforms. So we want to emphasize though, what, what those orgs do really, really well. And, and the whole point of platforms is uh, to enable application engineers to spend more time actually doing what's great for the business and less time doing sort of this undifferentiated mark about caring about infrastructure. And so. Uh, so all this is fine. I, th I think this is a pretty standard definition. Definitely staying away from being too prescriptive about one thing or another. Uh, it, it does raise the question, though, know, is, is this anything new? Uh, and, and the answer, you know, the no BS answer is it's, it's clearly not. A any of us have been in the industry for a long time. You know, I, I joined Amazon in 2006. There was an organization called Splat. They were building platforms. Platforms have been with us forever. You know, you have to get to a certain size where they're worth the investment. But, but there's nothing new here. So. Why are people sort of talking about it? Why has this platform engineering sort of become this sort of meme that uh, a lot of people are talking about? So uh, the reason I, I sort of come from this is uh, this is sort of my timeline, sort of what's happened to the industry between 2008 and 2023. 2008, when I was still an engineer, yeah, we, we, we had pets, but we had like three pets, and we, we, we stacked them up. They lasted three years, and then we never thought about infrastructure uh, the rest of the time. 2023, where we're all on cloud, yeah, we have all these different options now. But it, it seems like the configuration of cloud is constantly in application developers' face. Uh, and and I'll, I'll talk on the next slide about sort of all the different facets about uh, where this happens. And so, OK, so, so there's basically four, four things uh, that have, I think have sort of happened to infrastructure. And so uh, I, th I think we all know the public cloud where IAS, you know, infrastructure as a service sort of took on, it's just massively uh, complicated. Like, the, you know, Terraform is a very visible notion. You know, you see orgs just struggling with their massive Terraform files. You know, what does it mean to do differences? But, but Terraform is actually the least of it. You just look at the complexity of networking, look at the complexity of identity, uh, look at all the different services, how they have different pricing, how they have different magic limits. Y yeah, it's great that we've given developers all this choice, but that's just a lot of complexity that we're asking them to get right to, to have their shit run well in production. Um, next thing, you know, Kubernetes came along with this, you know, everything's a cattle, not pets mentality. But it turns out cattle have like, you know, hundreds of lines of YAML that you have to write just to get them to, to work the right way. In, in many ways, in terms of being in developers' faces, yeah, yeah Kubernetes is probably, you know, more reliable, can definitely uh, tolerate more things. In terms of actually configuring it to be reliable, it, it's just a lot of complexity that, that again, we've just sort of, as, as we've moved to these things, we've just sort of forced in application developers' faces. Um, open source is very orthogonal to this. So like open source, uh, you know, we, we all love open source, but open source, you know, my co-author says it's like free like a puppy. You know, it, it's great when your project is new, uh, but it has a lifetime ahead of it, someone has to care for it. And you've sort of just seen these big ecosystems of open source, very crucial, particularly to startups when they want to move fast, but someone has to own them over time, and it's not really clear uh, who, who wants to own it, particularly when they get, they get widely used. 
Now, now the, the question you ask yourself is like, why have we done this to ourselves? And this just comes to the, the last point, is that like the industry, with all the innovation, it's all sort of been spent on making our products as, as good as possible. Like you, you see legacy industries that have been upended by, you know, essentially just having a, a compared to having a better mobile app. And so we've sort of all been in this, this rush where, yeah, we have to make everything much better, a lot more data, a lot more richness. Um, and so we've just sort of taken on this complexity uh, as, as part of it. And, and I think where we, what, why platform engineering has become a talking point is everyone sort of realized, well, yeah, innovation slowing a little bit, but yeah, this, this can't be what everyone's doing in 2030, spending so much time on infrastructure and so little time on application. So, so the promise of, uh, of platform engineering is, I don't think we'll ever go back to how simple it was often on-prem, um, but to take away a lot of the complexity from most application developers. So basically the idea is platform teams take, take this complexity. They definitely make trade-offs. You, you definitely want to reduce the set of uh, options uh, that, that uh, each application team can make. Uh, but, but the selling point is for those application developers and definitely their management, they should actually be a lot more productive because then you have 10 apps looking fairly similar at the organization rather than having each 10 having chosen their own adventure. So. Okay, so the final thing though, again, this is where platforms not being new, uh, but platforms are hard. And so uh, uh, I, I think Bruce was talking earlier from Netflix, like the, you know, there's this massive migration problem that you often run into with platforms. So the best, the best platforms tend to get left behind by open source and vendors because they have just a lot more investment. Uh, and then they tend to, well, once that happens, is you go, okay, we, we need investment. We can fix this, but we need investment. Then they go underfunded versus new initiatives. Um, that would be okay. That's not great, of course, but that'd be okay if new initiatives were, 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 were very successful in deprecating the older, older platforms. But you sort of see them struggling. I'll, I'll definitely come back to this later in the talk about data struggle. You see them fail in two ways. So platform first, where it's the platform team sort of reasoning about eight different products. They really struggle to get uh, product, coherent product uh, requirements. And so, so it's very easy that they sit, you know, sit down and they say, okay, we're going to start building for one product. And then things change over the course of what they're building. And so, so uh, you often find these platform first issues are often the worst uh, platforms because not only do they uh, spend a lot of time, you end up with nothing at the end of it because no, no big uh, business is built, built in, uh, bought in. The other thing is though platform first initiatives, which is a lot of what we see, uh, also struggle. So these are often built by product orgs, just moving fast, looking for product market fit. Um, they often duplicate existing platforms. Uh, they leave migration, they leave scaling to others. And so the platform org tends to get like these unloved uh, toys sort of thrown over the fence, uh, but they, they're sort of understaffed to ever make better. And so, so the result across the industry is that like this crappy in-house pool of platforms. So, so in theory, what platform engineering as a movement should do is, is try and solve these problems. And so I'll talk how we did this at Datadog. Uh, so the first thing, you know, anytime, uh, particularly I, I find early stage managers, uh, they, they, they think that everything can be solved with org structure. And uh, Datadog did try to solve this with org structure. It actually ended up with a promotion for me. And, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the pros and cons of, of Datadog's approach. So, so this was Daydog when I got there in 2019. Uh, and, and what you see is I think it's seven VPs. Engineering was about 350. Uh, each of us managed about 50. And, and there, there, was one, there was one true sort of infra org, which, which had some platforms. But everything else was sort of this hybrid uh, platform product. Um, for those who do, do Daydog, Daydog's had the three big, the three pillars of, uh, of uh, observability, APM metrics logs. So they were big orgs. I had one of those orgs. Uh, then you had these like hybrid orgs in between that had some smaller products, some platforms. And so, so this, this was the org uh, that I came into. And it definitely, it had strengths as, as well as problems. So, so the big strength of this is, and particularly for the APM and logs product that was smaller, is when there was something that they wanted to build that didn't exist yet and was something platform-like, they, could, they just didn't have to talk about it. They were just going to go and build because everything they were being told from above is going after product market fit, going after competitors is the most important thing. And so for agility, particularly when you're in this competitive phase and you're trying to, to beat, beat uh, competitors, beat incumbents, it, it's very, very high because you just cut out all the conversation about how do we cooperate and, and just sort of let duplication happen. Um, the, the cons of that, of course, uh, turns out to be to multiple. The first thing is for the platform teams that were already platforms, uh, because they didn't have quite as much voice about what business leverage they were going to give, they kept losing in terms of recruiting resources. We, we didn't have headcount at this point. It was more social, but they just lost in having the best recruiters work for them. And so that, of course, meant them to underdevelop in their platforms. That then led to this flow-on problem, though, that the, the product leaders were like, well, you guys, uh, I, I gave you a chance, and you guys didn't do it, and so I'm just going to keep building pl uh, platforms myself. So you sort of found this reinforcing loop where product leaders believed they were great at building platforms. No, they're just great at getting recruiting and building uh, for their own product. Um, 
The second thing, and this actually happened, where, you know, well, I was one of the three VPs over metrics, um, where we did decide, okay, let's just, you know, let's just try three things and we'll see which one wins. We ended up fighting over, uh, over engineers, actually. We, we all know this is a tough talent market. We're going after storage specialists, distributed system specialists, and it was just very hard to hire them at the time. And so basically, any one of us who got it made our, our new platform, our studio platform, a little bit faster. We didn't make it fast. So, so the lack of cooperation really ended up, you could see very, very clearly now, it was hurting each of the, the big three of the, uh, of the, of the products. Um, the final thing is like, you know, this, this caused politics. Like politics is, happens in any org. Um, but the, the big clear, the lack of accountability, the fact the platforms were everywhere, each product leader had their own story around what was right and, and what, what was wrong, uh, really led to a lot of politics. Like, and the politics was just a lot of grumpiness at, at the VP layer, at my layer, where everyone had their own story about what was right for the customer, uh, right, what was right for the business, and, and they just weren't cohesive. They just weren't leading to the same place. So, so out of that, about 18 months in, uh, we ended up uh, Moving to a, 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 a sort of a core engineering, what we, we would have called it a platform engineering, but Datadog wants to be a platform, so that was confusing. We called it core engineering. And so, so the rule, I was SVP of core engineering. I actually ran half of engineering. So I think it was about 500, 500 when this happened. It was about 700, 700 when I left. And the rule was I could not have anything where I, there was revenue attached. So I, I didn't have all the platforms, but I got all the big platforms that had to work together to make the products uh, to work uh, very cohesively. So what, what you see on the left-hand side, you can see sort of Daydog as well moving to this product group strategy. So this is, again, as you go from four products to 20 products, you start wanting to align even the products to work better amongst themselves. So, so this is an org. Uh, this, this definitely had pros and cons. Uh, it was nice for me to get promoted, learn how to manage a lot more people. Uh, but it definitely wasn't a more fun job. It was, it was just a different job. Uh, so, so the pros, so, so the big thing, you know, my, my role, uh, or my, my most formal role in this organizational structure was coherent platform strategy. And, and what I meant by coherency is to the extent that we had duplication, it was for good reasons. It might be different timelines uh, in, of delivery, it might just be legacy. But I, I really wanted to stop that, okay, we're all going to keep doing the same thing, and someday the one master platform is going to come and rule them all. So coherent strategy is, is the major thing, that in that org structure now, you have one person whose job sees them to do that. Um, the big thing that I came with it was, was headcount funding. Because I was also on top of headcount, uh, it really stopped this game that you sort of see people without being bad, but they tend to play it, where it's like, OK, I think my leadership is wrong that the business needs this. I'm just going to fund this with one engineer anyway, and it'll get headcount once it succeeds, because I know that because I'm close to the business. So, so the problem with that is that it kills the coherent strategy, right? You basically have uh, di directors playing it and miss games. And so basically, you know, my, my job was to sort of be the backstop, which is, look, if you end up doing something that wasn't on your plan, I'm not going to be happy with you just because people tell, you, tell me they want it. I'm going to ask why you couldn't do this and tell me ahead of time and get buy-in from the greater organization. So, so again, this sense of coherency of what we're doing and why, that's really what you get from the plat uh, a centralized platform org. Um, the big thing, though, was like it didn't fi naturally fix the problem that each of the products orgs had different priorities with different timelines that always trade off like uh, feature agility versus uh, being very sure on dates. Some cared a lot about reliability, some didn't. Uh, th the idea that like the CPO could make these godlike calls about all these different decisions that were, like, were, were mattering at the bottom of the org just, just wasn't a realistic thing. Th these were strong leaders who believed in what they had. My, my job was to help the org make decisions, but th th that wasn't you know, just going to come through someone else making decisions. We, we had to create information. Um, second thing I talked, like the politics didn't go away. It was funny, I, I sort of resented this heavily that people talked about the platform org being a thing and it being the source of problems. This is just what humans do. You, you build an org, it has a name, they're going to blame it for things, even if those things actually have much more complex issues. So the politics remained. I actually think the politics went down. The politics remained. Um, the big thing, the platforms became more bureaucratic. So for me to actually be able to deliver a little bit on time, I had to hire way more TPMs than I ever thought I would hire. As, as an engineer, I, I hated working with TPMs, so it was sort of hard for me to sort of force them on my engineers. But, but really, this was sort of the deal with my org, is the TPMs were a large, uh, some amount of, uh, Delivery on time was a big part of what the org was getting out of this org structure. So looking back, I, I do think this was probably likely needed. Like we really were struggling to make the multi-product uh, pivot, uh, and so given where we were in our lifetime, I, I think it was probably the right thing. It's interesting; most orgs would not have it being half of engineering. That's just part of uh, Daydog's uh, strategy. 
Um, high level trust was really the key though. So it's like all of these things. It wasn't the, the paperwork, what was on paper. It was having the support of my CTO, having the support of my SVP peer. Because what's always going to happen is misalignment between the two orgs, and you really need to diffuse as a leader. So as much as the org structure helped, it was this trust that really made it work day to day. Uh, my, my thing was keep emphasizing whether products want agility or velocity. They don't really know. They, 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 want, they want both, of course. And you have to keep saying, you know, which do you really want? And you know, if I give it to you, I'm going to have to take it away from you. And you have to do it. W one thing that really helped me with this in hindsight was not putting all the platforms in the platform org. Because each of the product VPs actually had a pl small platform themselves, it was easy for them to relate to the fact that, oh, yeah, you can't keep everyone happy all the time. Um, and so, so that was something that I did for other reasons, but it turned out to be, to be really, really good. So, OK, so that's what we sort of did in terms of org structure. Uh, the, the next thing is, how did Daydog actually build platforms? So how, how did we take you know, within the org structure? And the, the big caveat with this is this was more an observed pattern uh, that over time I became to leverage once I understood it. But this was something Daydog did fairly naturally uh, itself, and it just turned out to work really, really well. So, so I, I call this the three-phase model. I, I call it the scrappy platform, scalable platform, robust platform. I, I, I emphasize you want to incrementally re-architect, and it's all about success to go between the phases. So if you have a scrappy platform that doesn't succeed that well, you, you never get beyond it. Um, so, so I have four dimensions that I break each of these down for, which is the focus of the people building the platform, who should generally own it, uh, how planning is done, and how, how develop, what development focuses on. So a scrappy platform is the type of thing that we're, we're all sort of used to. It's usually built by a product team. Ideally, you've got in front of them and told them, hey, this should be a platform someday. So there's some amount of cooperation there. Uh, I'd say some of Daydog's successes, though, didn't really even have that and ended up succeeding anyway. Um, of course, usually with a bit more friction down the track. Um, it's usually better owned by product teams. Product engineers, you know, at this point, you're very much in discovery of what the product is, whether the product's going to be successful, and what the platform needs to be. And so platform just adds a layer of impedance. It's just this layer of management that is one remove from trying to agilely iterate. So, so generally, it's better done by product teams. Planning, is, planning for the platform is little. Uh, we did quarterly OKRs. So our product teams planned. You know, they did RFCs on what their platforms could be. But it was, it was way less planning, you know, way less running on schedule than what we would have to do later. Um, development, this sort of repeats what I, what I said earlier, all about feature agility. Uh, you'd find here uh, they heavily leveraged open source. This was one of Daydog's big key to success in its like, first seven years, was they took open source and they beat the hell out of it. Like, they, they took everything they cared in terms of leveraging it until it would not work anymore. And that's how they kept scaling, uh, kept moving fast as their customers needed them to. Um, and the, the key th one key thing you saw at this point, the platform was just often a shared code base. Like there was no difference between the platform code and the, well, the, the customer platform code and the platform code. It was all just shared in one, one big code base. So phase two is after that succeeded, you sort of move to what I call a scalable platform. And this is often when you want to move it to a platform organization. And what's usually happened is one product you know, is built on top of it, loves it, and a, a bunch of other products now want to get on board. Usually these products are the fast moving products. So you'd, you'd see these as high momentum. They could afford to be somewhat scrappy um, as, as they sort of came on board. Um, the, the big thing I emphasize here, the owner is the platform team, but the directors and VPs make feature calls. And what I mean by that is there's still a lot of agility that tends to be needed. Like products are going to be fighting customer by customer. And you, you can't just say, hey, we've got this roadmap. We're going to be inflexible. A lot of flexibility is sort of needed at the scalable platform stage. And so what you're doing in that stage is you're building out a lot of scalability, reliable security, you know, all the things that infra orgs do really, really well. Of course, you're doing it on someone else's code base. So this is like the changing the engine of the car as it runs, uh, runs down a road. This is a lot of where a platform org actually adds its value, as opposed to st doing that zero to one. Um, because you get better interfaces uh, between customer and platform code. It's also where like, the, where the good software developers who really want to do more complex stuff in-house, you do start replacing open source, but very judiciously. Like, Daydog, at this point, still in some of its platforms, had a lot of open source to, with a lot of leverage in, in terms of what it was doing. So final, final stage is where you get like, you know, I want to say 10 plus products on you. The big thing with 10 plus is like you now have so many stakeholders, it's very hard to get them to agree about what's most important. So a lot of the stuff you see, you know, the, the big company stuff starts happening. You either want a TPM or a product manager to manage your roadmap. Your roadmap has to be fairly, you know, fairly tight. You, you know, you can't be underestimating ops load and missing dates by months some of the time. 
Um, so, so it's very, very rigorous planning, much more than you ever had to do at phase one and two. A lot of management here is convincing engineers, hey, we've just got to do this. We didn't do this in the past, we had to do this. Um, you see, in ensuring, securing reliability or enterprise grade, it's, it's funny, at Datadog, uh, for the robust platforms, I started bringing in like change management, which again was a thing I detested as an engineer, and I knew if my engineers would detest it, we were just too big to take the types of outages that we used to have. So that, that was a big thing at sort of this point, robust platform. These strong barriers, this is where, again, you know, one business taking down another now is unacceptable. You know, you, you, you customers don't want that anymore. So you have to start building a lot of isolation. And this is fun engineering work to do. Um, lots of in-housing stuff, finally. This is the stuff where, hey, maybe you go build like Netflix or you go build like Facebook and, and stop using so much open source. So in hindsight, uh, the, the big thing that we sort of learned, again, this was a model more observed than anything that was planned, although once I observed it, I started leveraging it because I made mistakes until I really saw it. All successful platforms, all platforms that got to that phase three with that carrying the business started scrappy. We, we, we could not short circuit if it's the scrappiness or the internal architecture or the incremental architectures. And the reason was the same in, in both cases. Well, one of the reasons it's the same in both cases is we know building a platform from scratch takes a lot of time. And so the big problem with starting either, either a re-architecture or just a V2 from scratch is it just takes too long and the business has moved on. And they sort of blame you for believing the, na the last product leader. And, and that's, that's just the nature of it. So you, you really want, don't want to do a big bang uh, of either of those. Um, yeah, let's sort of talk about it. It's the, it's the product leader for a day. Whoever's telling you this is the exact perfect thing today may not be in that position in a year. And, and that's on you. You have to make the decision. So uh, th that's the end of the talk. Uh, so my top three learnings is, you know, most application engineers at most companies, I know it sounds weird saying this in 2023, but they should not be doing Terraform and YAML. This is not leverage to a business. This is just an artifact of where we are as an industry migrating to the cloud. I do think, uh, so second point is platform engineering is not really about org structure. Yeah, org structure could solve some problems, creates other problems. I definitely wouldn't want people to think that this is the, the band-aid, oh, we need a platform engineering org. Uh, to me, the big thing is management, no matter what your org structure is, who really is able to convince the types of engineers who want to take on that scrappy work and do the re-architecture, sort of take reliability for something they didn't build. That, to me, is what, good plat is what ends up building good platforms uh, over time. And so with that, I am done. Thank you. So it sounds like you were a reluctant platform leader, <laughs> and there's a lot of politics at push and pull. So is your book going to become a movie, a drama? <laughs> <laughs> the, the book is actually probably earlier in the, uh, my, my st uh, stage, so it's actually more for fun stuff. I, I do th like, the truth is, if you're managing 700 people, your job is politics in some sense, and it's actually often more politics downwards than even sideways. You've just got to a point where there's just hard mismatches in alignment, and your job as a leader is to help align. So, yeah, I, as, a, as a leader, I, you know, I always, 100 engineers was about my sweet spot, I find, in hindsight. <laughs> uh, it, uh, 700 wasn't always fun. All right, well, thank you for the no BS approach. I appreciate it, for sure. Okay, so questions. Make sure and put your questions into Slido. I think Slido might be having a bit of a lag, but we have at least one so far. What is your take on engineers making lateral movement from application to platform teams? Internal training plus certifications classes versus hiring externally? Yeah, it's a good question. So in the book, I, I, there's this guy called Simon Wormsley who has this uh, trichotomy called Pioneer Settler Town Planner. And he talks about it as engineers' different motivations. And what you find is a lot of product engineers are fundamentally pioneers. Like they're, they're very frustrated unless they see a quick turn cycle uh, in terms of what they do and seeing it make an impact on the business. I, I think for those types of engineers, they're always going to struggle with platform teams. Platform teams are always going to be slower in terms of how they have feature release cycles. However, just because someone is in a product team today, you know, they could have been a grad. This just could have been a team that they ended up on, they started out on. They might not know what they don't know yet. They might not know who they are. So, so I do think, so for the first question is, is trying to find out their motivation. Like again, if they're looking, oh, I'm going to come to the, the, the platform team and make stuff move really, really fast. That, that isn't going to be a great hire for a platform team. If it's though like, you know, I'm super curious, you know, this Kubernetes complexity, that's super curious to me. I really want to learn more. So to me, that's the first thing that sort of does the vetting. After that, like, honestly, engineers are engineers. If, if you have a good functioning team, I would happily throw them in a team of five and, and have them learn from the team. Um, so, so, so to me, yeah, I think more about it as motivation. And again, if they're very set on fast feedback loops, trying to convince them that, look, look you should stay on the product side. That's always going to be where, where fast feedback loops are. All right. 
Okay, so I don't think we have any more in Slido, and I apologize if you've put your question in Slido. Sometimes there's a bit of a lag. Does anybody want to ask a question live? Back here, we might need you to speak up. Can you hear? I can't hear we you, can't, sorry. Could you come closer? I'm sorry. <laughs> Our challenge always is that you know when the platform or new product do innovation, then we require the product team to migrate and always have to do correction. How do you kind of manage that? Uh, you know, besides. Yeah, so, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll repeat the question. So Ro Roblox, of course, have, has a big platform team and has the challenge that often what the infra team wants to do, you definitely saw this during the Kubernetes migration, but otherwise, uh, you, know, you end up with migrations to put a large amount of cost on your org. So, so one reason, again, this is you know, by the book, but the book's six months away, uh, but we heavily emphasize in the book, particularly my co-author, who was like, really burned by migrations at earlier points in her career, um, is that it is the job of the platform org to make uh, migrations as easy as, as they can for the rest of the org. One challenge, like pure infra, you know, pure infra orgs, they'll say they hire software engineers, they're often not hiring the best software engineers, and they really struggle to write some of the migration glue code that can honestly make a, you know, a, a migration that's painful for like 50% of your users is into something that's more 20% of your users. So, so I, I think, you know, apart from, you know, the, the dumb stuff, you know, get your APIs right or whatever, which we all get wrong, I, I do think it is having your platform engineers invest in every single way that they can to make the migrations easier for the customer. Like, it should de like my sense of migrations is the tail 20% is always going to be hard because it's always hard. But some infra teams, just by nature, they, they, they just sort of assume the whole company is going to do it because the mandate's going to come down because it's for security without investing in it. Now, of course, you know, if you're in a position, this, of course, requires you to ask for more software engineers. There's always, you know, how do you win the headcount games to get that? But, but to me, that, like, making migrations go away for most engineers just has to be part of what a good uh, infrastructure platform does. Great. It looks like we have, let's take this one first, then this one. Go ahead. Scalable. Oh, thank you. How do you think about graduating platforms from scrappy to scalable to robust? Uh, what kind of measures do you use to make those decisions? So, so it was less a decision and more an observation. Actually, I probably didn't, uh, it probably didn't emphasize it enough as I said it. So generally, the successes were always incrementally reactive. So when something's done incrementally, at no point are you actually, is it it, right? Like at some point you're calling it it. I, I'd say that the biggest question, particularly at management though, was the investment question, which is, Generally, to, 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 to have a chance at even getting to that next level, you're adding engineers. And so, so what you tend to see there is uh, lots, of ha lots of products on top of it, lots of products that are still yet to use it, and, and just clear problems that it's, it's solving by a deep investment. So it's often, the, the way I've said to this, like an order of magnitude is, is probably too loose, but you often look for, can you make you know, sub-substantial workloads half the price of what they are. Not every workload, but, half, but do we realize what our workloads are? And that often is a good re way to justify to the business that now we're going to do it. Honestly, the, the biggest one is always uh, reliability going up. Like you just end up with something that you know is completely unengineered versus the reliability needs of the business. And so as a leader, it's like, yeah, you know, you're, you're, the case that you're going to make for headcount is, look, this was not architected for the reliability that it needs and let us invest. So yeah, to me, it's more ahead of time. Then you hope who you've you've staffed up actually delivers what, what you've uh, funded them to deliver. All right, we had a gentleman over here. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not getting the questions <laughs> uh, no on worries. my side. Thank you, Ian. <laughs> uh, in retrospect, if you had to do it again, uh, do you believe you could have uh, empowered the engineering teams earlier to avoid having TPMs and avoid uh, having change management? I don't think so. I, I think it's, it's a great question. Uh, if you just look at the legacy, though, of scrappy platforms, is the idea is if, if we try and build them ahead of product market fit, we're going to build the wrong thing. So we're going to let this is what we have to adapt to. The problem once you've got that is you've always got something under-engineered versus the growing demands of the business. And so you sort of have to adapt to it. So you know, I, I saw this in my time in AWS. I saw it in Datadog. Like it's, 
I'd say it's very, very difficult. Like, you'd say maybe Google succeeded, you know, in its earlier stages where they just had so much headcount come in, they could just build for that order of magnitude of scale with another confidence. I, I think most of us, though, just struggle with landing the headcount to build it well ahead of actually it showing the success that demands it. So, so that does mean you have to fall back to some of these older processes. Um, there's definitely, you know, within that, like, all the good stuff around CI, CD and, you know, shared deployments, the sooner you get those in there, the easier it is to innovate. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I think it's somewhat tied to the nature. If you believe that this is the, the way that they're going to be invented, then you sort of believe that, yeah, over time we are going to become more process-bound. So is there anybody else that hey. had a question? Oh, hey, right here? Okay. Um, hey, uh, uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, how did you uh, structure your platform and your product teams, specifically from uh, the perspective of uh, uh, how did uh, how did the platform teams uh, essentially engage with the product teams to get the requirements and then synthesize that and build that in a durable way? Yeah, so it, it was different with the different stages of the platform. So, so Daydog in particular, uh, at the early, you know, at that uh, not the, the scalable stage, heavily relied upon the directors and uh, engineering managers to to essentially be the product managers and basically to go meet with a lot of people. And it, it worked great if you had like ten. The people who started having like 30 internal customers with different voices really start to struggle. Uh, there was within like uh, I was actually banned from hiring product managers because they didn't want to have product managers tied to the platform more. So what we tend to do is get TPMs, but I, but I definitely can say there's a TPM who can do this and there's a TPM that can't. There's a TPM who wants everything to be really well defined so they can go execute on it. That isn't product management. Product manager is going and taking the uncertain and making it into the certain. So it sort of took these switch hitter TPMs. That, so that was the, as we scaled it, that was our biggest successes, I think, um, as we scaled up the org. You know, in general, like there's other stuff. We had a, you build it, you own it, you run it. So there was all teams wore a pager um, for their bit of a software. It wasn't just the platform teams that some companies do. Um, so yeah, I think those are probably the major aspects of, of the structure. All right, I think that's all the time we have for questions, except for my question for you, which is, what do you enjoy doing so much that you completely lose track of time? Yes, yeah, so, so I, th I thought about this one. There's actually like two, th there's the revealed preference, it's sort of what I do, which at the moment is playing Baldur's Gate 3, because that game just like destroys your, uh, your timeline. <laughs> uh, once that goes away, I'll be back to normal. Like I, I'm still at, at heart like a guy who loves engineering, loves the details, so I spend, probably two to three hours a day that I shouldn't be spending on hacking you, still just loving what's happening, you know, what's out there and where all the innovation's happening. So, so yeah, to me, that's the easiest place where time disappears. All right, well, somebody needs to do it for the rest <laughs> of us. So thank you so much. It was an amazing talk. And I appreciate you answering all the questions.